My name is Amber Knoll and this is Eating for Memory. I work for Purdue Extension. I'm the Health and Human Sciences Educator for Purdue Extension in Tippecanoe County. If you are not familiar with Purdue Extension, we are the outreach arm of the university. So Purdue being the land grant university for the state of Indiana has a few different responsibilities. Two of those are teaching and research, and that happens on campus. And then the third one is extending that knowledge across the state. So Purdue Extension serves all 92 counties across the state of Indiana, and we cover program areas including health and human sciences, 4-H youth development, agriculture and natural resources, and community development. So our goal is to address local community needs by providing research-based and trusted information that will help people solve those issues and concerns in their own backyard. So today we are going to cover eating for memory. I would like to first point out and make a point of saying that you are your brain. So our lifestyle choices, the things that we choose every day to put in our mouth, or if we decide to exercise or watch another episode of TV shows on Netflix, all of those choices add up and can have a profound impact on our brain health and our overall health. So things like aging and genetics we cannot control, but we can control those lifestyle choices. So today I want to talk about how memory works and get all of us on the same page. I'm going to cover what is normal versus what's not so normal for memory loss. We'll dive into some specific nutrients that are being researched and are being linked to better brain health. And then we will finish by talking about some of those other lifestyle choices that we should be aware of. These next few slides are not meant to be comprehensive. They are meant to get everyone on the same page. So we all have a baseline idea of what we mean when we say the word memory. Memory is defined by Merriam-Webster as the power or process of reproducing or recalling what's been learned and retained. So memory is quite the complicated process and we are still working to understand all of the moving parts and bits and pieces but these following definitions come from the University of California, San Francisco's Memory and Aging Center. Episodic memories are what most people think of as a memory and include information about recent or past events and experiences. So where did I park my car in the parking lot? What did I eat for lunch at this specific restaurant last month? So this is what we usually think of when we talk about a memory. Semantic memory refers to general knowledge, including knowledge of facts. So I can tell you what kind of car I drive, I can tell you the capital of Indiana, I can tell you what an elephant is, so it's a fact-based memory. Next we've got the memory of events that occurred in the distant past, and this is the type of episodic memory that's referred to as remote or long-term memory. Remote episodic memories tend to not be as severely disrupted as recent episodic memories in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So this is where if you have a loved one who has dementia or Alzheimer's disease and they can't tell you what they did yesterday, but they could talk for hours about what happened the summer they turned 13, that's where this is coming from. So we're finding that those long-term memories are more intact than some recent memories in these neurodegenerative diseases. Working memory is used to describe the process where one can kind of hold on to and manipulate small bits of current information like a telephone number. So if I'm having a conversation and someone rattles off their telephone number, for a short period of time, I can remember most of those numbers, if not all of them. So I'm working with that information in order to remember that telephone number. The ability to be able to do that is based on a couple of different things like attention and executive function. So executive function, 
executive function depends on three types of brain function, the working memory, mental flexibility, and self-control. So if I don't have the ability to sit still or pay attention for whatever reason, my working memory will be impacted. Um, so this capacity for our working memory is limited and we can only keep a few bits of information at a time. And that's depending on paying attention, if there are a lot of distractions in the room, how fast the information is being provided and things like that. So if I go back to that telephone number that I'm working with and someone's screaming their telephone number to me in a really loud concert, I'm going to have a harder time remembering that phone number versus if we were sitting at the bus stop or in a coffee shop where I can better concentrate on the conversation. Each of these types of memory that we've talked about, so episodic, semantic, remote, and working, each of these uses a different network in the brain, and therefore one type of memory can be affected by disease or injury, while another type will function normally. So how does memory work? Again, this is not meant to be comprehensive. It's meant to give a brief overview to kind of lay the basis of what we're talking about when we talk about forming a memory. So forming an episodic memory has a few steps. Remember that episodic memories are what most people think of, uh, think of as memory and include information about recent or past events and experiences. The first step in forming an episodic memory is called encoding, and this is the process of receiving and registering information. The process of encoding is dependent on paying attention to an event or information, and therefore memory is dependent on the ability to pay attention. If you aren't paying attention to an event while it's happening, then you're less likely to remember details from the event. Or if you're in a very busy place and you're trying to pay attention to one specific thing that's happening and there are a lot of distractions, it'll be harder to remember what you're trying to pay attention to. Encoding of episodic memories is also influenced by how you process events. Encoding information, that can be strengthened when you're able to make connections with the information that you are trying to learn or relate that information to past experiences. So for example, if I'm meeting a lot of people at the same time, I'm more likely to remember someone who has the same name as my mom because I can relate their name back to previously known information. So I've known my mom my whole life, so it's easier for me to remember that person's name because it's the same name. Where, especially if I'm meeting 30 or 40 people at the same time, I'm less likely to remember someone's name that I've never met someone with their name before because I have nothing to relate it back to. The next step is memory consolidation, and this is the process by which memory traces of encoded information are strengthened, stabilized, and stored to facilitate later retrieval. Consolidation is also most effective when that information that you are trying to store can be related back to existing known information, and it's also strengthened by repeated access of information being remembered. So if I'm shooting the same person an email every single week and I'm constantly typing out their email address, I will be more likely to remember their email, their email address because I'm accessing that information in my brain constantly. Where if I'm trying to remember an email that I haven't used in over a year, then I'll have to look that up because I haven't been actively remembering that information as often. The last step in forming episodic memories is called retrieval, and this is also known as remembering. So it's the conscious recollection of information that was encoded and stored. So if this information was not properly encoded because we were distracted or something of that nature, we weren't able to pay attention, then we'll be less likely to be able to retrieve details of the event or information. I also want to talk about memory loss. So putting us all on the same page of what's normal for memory loss versus what's not normal for memory loss. 
Some decline in cognitive function is a natural part of aging, but there can be different degrees of severity for different individuals. Feeling forgetful can be due to all sorts of things. So maybe I didn't get enough sleep last night. Maybe I didn't eat breakfast or lunch and it's the mid-afternoon, so I'm feeling a little distracted and hard, having a hard time concentrating. Maybe my activity level or lifestyle or health conditions. Um, maybe the room I'm in is really hot and really loud, so I can't quite concentrate. Um, this depends on all... Feeling forgetful depends on all sorts of factors. As we age, subtle memory changes do occur. Sometimes these are unnoticed changes, but at other times they can be really alarming, not only to ourselves, but also to others. Some degree of memory problems, as well as a modest decline in other thinking skills, is a fairly common part of aging. Some people are also naturally more forgetful, and that's worsened by age. Simple forgetfulness or delays in recalling things like names or events or locations and difficulty learning new information is still a part of the normal aging process. Most normal changes in memory are manageable and do not interfere with daily activities or quality of life. So you're still able to go to work, you're still able to live independently and maintain a social life despite the fact that maybe you can't learn a new language as quickly as you used to be able to. When we start being concerned about memory loss is when it prevents us from performing routine or regular tasks because it becomes, um, it becomes a health concern that needs further evaluation by healthcare professionals. So beyond normal memory loss, with aging, keep in mind that I said it may begin to take longer to learn new information or to pull back some of those memories of knowledge that we've already learned, like a really old phone number. But with some extra time and some extra effort, we are usually able to remember those things. Um, another difference is we are able to tell when we are forgetting. So I, in the moment, realize that I can't remember that phone number and that's normal. So some people are naturally more forgetful, but memory loss is abnormal when it's severe enough to interfere with everyday regular functioning. So things like self-care, I forgot to take a bath, um, and I didn't realize that I forgot to take a bath. I'm not taking my medications or paying my bills. Um, I'm not completing daily chores or other household tasks that I've done regularly for my life. I start making poor judgment. So maybe I'm still driving and I know to yield to oncoming traffic, but I forgot and I just merge into traffic without looking. Um, that becomes a poor judgment that could be indicative of some abnormal memory loss. Um, and like I mentioned earlier on this slide, the loss of insight or awareness of the memory loss. So not realizing that you're forgetting can also be a sign of abnormal memory loss, as well as behavioral symptoms like irritability or large mood swings into moods that that person hasn't experienced before. So maybe they're very upbeat and carefree and all of a sudden they're very angry and they worry about everything and they're very suspicious. That can be a clear sign that some form of abnormal memory loss is occurring. So this abnormal memory loss usually begins gradually and then worsens over time. So maybe you sort of notice it in a loved one and then all of a sudden something happens and it's really obvious. Um, I will say that if you are concerned about your memory loss or are concerned about a loved one's memory loss, please talk to a doctor. Um, the quicker that a proper diagnosis is provided, then appropriate care can get started sooner. Um, a prompt diagnosis is very important for appropriate treatment, and the earlier things are diagnosed and treatment begins, the more options there are in that treatment plan. So moving into specific nutrients. So cognitive performance, especially in older age, can be influenced by a number of factors, but the association between nutrition and cognition has become a topic of increasing scientific and public interest. 
So as time marches forward, we're starting to learn a lot more about this connection between what we eat and our brain health and our overall health. Even though brain cells naturally degenerate as we age, we can still help our brains through lifestyle changes. Just as nutrients are necessary to keep bodies healthy, the same is true for our brains. Research has shown that a healthy diet can help lower the risk of dementia, which is an umbrella term used to describe a set of symptoms, including impairment in memory, reasoning, judgment, language, and other thinking skills. There's still a lot that we are researching and learning, and there's all sorts of things to still know about nutrition. Um, so we're learning a lot more every day about what makes a brain healthy diet. But for now, the best advice is to follow a nutrient-rich diet. Diets rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, fish, and healthier fats can provide brain-boosting memory functions and help support better health overall. Certain foods are not just good for the brain, but they are also helpful in sustaining a healthy body. There's no guarantee that these nutrients will help you to remember where you put your keys, um, but supporting lifelong good health and having better health overall helps support that brain. Eating well is more than a diet, it's also a lifestyle. That lifestyle includes cooking and eating fresh foods, savoring the taste of foods we eat, both healthy and if it's a less than healthy option like a cookie or a giant piece of cake, we should still take the time to enjoy those foods. And then enjoying the dining experience with family and friends. So over the next couple of slides, we will start to dive into specific nutrients. Our first nutrient that we are going to talk about is antioxidants. So as we age, our brains are exposed to more harmful stresses due to lifestyle and environmental factors, resulting in a process called oxidation. This damages brain cells. Food rich in antioxidants can help fend off the harmful effects of oxidation in our brains. Vitamins E and C are antioxidants as are flavonoids. Dietary flavonoids are naturally occurring in fruit, vegetables, chocolate, and beverages like wine and tea. There's been a lot of interest in the potential health effects of flavonoids, especially those associated with fruits and vegetable-rich diets. Research shows that nutrient-rich diets help to maintain brain health and may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. So fruits and vegetables are loaded with antioxidants. So things like berries, including blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries, cherries, pomegranates, grapes, watermelon, dark leafy greens, so that's more than just kale, spinach and romaine also count as dark leafy greens, sweet red peppers, kiwis, almonds, avocados, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, brussels sprouts, kale, cabbage, and bok choy are all loaded with antioxidants. A lot of spices and herbs are also packed with antioxidants that may lower harmful inflammation in the brain and other body tissues. So things like turmeric, cinnamon, thyme, and ginger. Cinnamon has one of the highest antioxidant levels of any spice. There are as many antioxidants in one teaspoon of cinnamon as a full cup of pomegranate juice or half a cup of fresh blueberries. Thyme is another popular herb. A teaspoon of thyme has about the same amount of antioxidants as a carrot or half a cup of chopped tomatoes. When we cook with herbs and spices, that helps to cut out the salt and sodium intake in our diets as well, and that has its own health benefits. We know that low sodium diets help prevent heart disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes. Another food on the screen is dark cocoa. So that contains flavonoids and can potentially improve blood flow to the brain and reduce inflammation. Unsweetened dark cocoa powder offers the greatest benefit, followed by dark chocolate with at least 7% cocoa solids. So unfortunately, that blizzard from Dairy Queen with a small amount of chocolate in it doesn't quite count. We're looking for the unsweetened dark cocoa powder followed by dark chocolate with at least 7% cocoa solids, and that'll be listed on the label. 
And then the last thing in the bottom right hand corner, you see a cup of coffee. So coffee or tea. Coffee has been shown to improve memory and potentially lower the risk of dementia. Up to three cups of black coffee a day are recommended. Black and green tea contains brain boosting antioxidants as does coffee. Make sure that you give your tea plenty of time to seep before you drink it to get the maximum benefits. Also note that I said black coffee. So when we start adding things like sugar or fancy creamers to our coffee, the added saturated fat and sugar can contribute to unnecessary added sugar and sodium in our diet. And those can negate the effects of the antioxidants in those drinks. Our next nutrient is healthy fats. Outside of adipose tissue, which is body fat, the nervous system, which includes our nerves, our brain, and our spinal cord, has the greatest concentration of lipids or fat in the human body. Nerve cell membranes need healthy fats, such as long chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids to help keep their shape and structure. Many times the shape of something in the body helps to determine its function, Eating healthy fats like mono and polyunsaturated fats and fatty acids help to maintain the structure of these cells in the nervous system, which helps to regulate their functionality. So foods that are good sources of healthy fats include avocado, fatty fish like salmon, trout, sardines, bluefin, tuna, and herring, olives and olive oil, nuts like walnuts and almonds, and then if you are not quite a fan of fish, you could try walnuts, flax seeds, or soybeans instead. Complex carbohydrates are also helpful for brain functioning. When you eat, food is turned into a sugar called glucose by your body, which is a carbohydrate. The brain accounts for approximately 25% of total body glucose utilization at rest, despite it representing only 2% of our adult body weight. The brain prefers glucose as its fuel source and has many ways of ensuring glucose is readily available. Glucose can come from many sources. Complex carbohydrates offer the glucose needed by the body. Many complex carbohydrate foods contain fiber, vitamins, and minerals, and they take longer to digest, which means that they have less of an immediate impact on blood sugar, causing that blood sugar to rise more slowly. Complex carbohydrates include things like whole grains, like oatmeal or quinoa, many fruits and vegetables, and beans. Whole grains like oats, barley, and quinoa are rich in many of the B vitamins that work to reduce inflammation of the brain, potentially preserving our memory. Legumes, fruits, and vegetables are also great sources of complex carbohydrates. So remember these complex carbohydrates have a variety of nutrients. So they have fiber, they have vitamins, they have minerals. Where something like a simple carbohydrate, if I were to sit here and eat a tablespoon of white sugar, that would be processed by my body much quicker without those added nutrients that are found in a complex carbohydrate. Moving on to B vitamins. The B vitamins comprise a group of eight water-soluble vitamins that perform essential, closely interrelated roles in many functions within the body. Their collective essential or their collective effects are particularly prevalent to numerous aspects of brain function, including energy production, DNA and RNA synthesis and repair, genomic and non-genomic methylation, and the synthesis of numerous neurochemicals and signaling molecules. There is evidence suggesting that adequate levels of all members of this group of micronutrients are essential for optimal physiological and neurological functioning. Of particular interest are folate, which is also B9, and then vitamins B12 and B6. These three B vitamins work together to lower blood homocysteine concentration. Too much homocysteine in the blood has been associated with increased risk of cognitive decline and dementia in older adults. So foods that are a good source of B vitamins include dark leafy greens. So remember I mentioned kale and spinach, but romaine lettuce is also a great source. 
whole grains including bran, quinoa, oatmeal, and brown rice, shellfish and crustaceans, so things like oysters, mussels, clams, shrimp, and lobster, nuts and seeds, and then egg yolks in moderation. Um, if you are concerned about your cholesterol, one egg per day is fine for most. The protein, vitamins B, D, and E, and eggs and egg yolks are, are being linked to um, helping people improve their memory. So if you're concerned with your cholesterol, you can mix whole eggs and egg whites, um, but up to one a day is generally considered fine. I'd recommend talking to your doctor if you are concerned about that. Our last nutrient, if you want to think of it that way, is water. So we don't commonly think of water as a nutrient, but it's required in amounts that exceed our body's ability to produce it. All of our biochemical reactions in the body occur in water, and then it also fills the spaces in and between the cells and helps to form structures of large molecules, so things like protein or glycogen. Water is beneficial to brain health. Um, when we become dehydrated, even if it's a mild dehydration, we can start to reduce our mental energy and then that can start to impair our memory. Thirst is generally a really poor mechanism to gauge if we are hydrated or not. Um, many things start to affect our thirst, including any, any medications we're on, our activity level, and our diet. So if I'm exercising in water, I may not realize that I'm becoming dehydrated, or if I'm running really far, I'll start to feel that a lot quicker. So that thirst mechanism can be a really bad indicator if we're hydrated or not. The best way to tell if we are properly hydrated is to check the color of our urine. So if you notice that you are sitting at your desk all day and you never get up to go to the bathroom, that's a sure sign that your body may be entering a dehydrated state. Um, another way that I like to think about this is if you are your family's dishwasher, you know it's really hard to scrub dirty dishes with a dry sponge. So our bodies are those sponges. We work best when we've got water, just like those dish sponge. Those dish sponges, when we've got a little water on the sponge, it's a lot easier to clean our dishes. So our body's the same way. Hydration is incredibly important, and a lot of us aren't drinking enough water. You may have noticed as we were going through those nutrients that a lot of foods were repeated. Eating a variety of colorful fruits and vegetables can help to give an array of healthy nutrients that keep these functions in our body happening as they should. Vitamins and minerals, which includes antioxidants, are responsible for helping to carry out many of the chemical reactions that occur in our bodies that allow us to do everyday functions. Um, and these nutrients often occur in food as colors. So if we think about when you're a little kid, you often hear that you should eat carrots because they are good for your eyes. So vitamin A is found in carrots and vitamin A helps to complete the vision cycle. So those vitamins and minerals help to drive those chemical reactions in our body that help carry out functions such as seeing and other important things that we're used to being able to do. These foods that we've talked about on the previous slides can be worked into any eating pattern, but there's a whole slew of research that supports a diet where eating a variety of whole foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy, lean proteins, and healthy fats, and then consuming things like salt, added sugars, and saturated fats in low doses, um, not only for optimum health, but also for lowering the risk of chronic disease. So we have a ton of research showing that that's a really healthy eating pattern. And popular diets that support these principles include the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So DASH stands for the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And both the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet are backed by extensive and adequate research. Um, these recommendations are also closely related to the recommendations made by the American Heart Association as well as the American Diabetes Association. Um, the main difference between the two, the DASH is usually thought of as the more Americanized version of the Mediterranean diet. 
Um, it generally includes more dairy. And then the Mediterranean diet, if you look at the top of the pyramid, you see that um, they recommend or they suggest wine in moderation but our recommendation is that if you do not drink don't start drinking just because the mediterranean diet says so you'll also notice at the bottom of the pyramid we have our water so we've talked about the importance of water and then we also see um, people are getting physical activity they are or they're eating together so they're socializing and then we see a pot with some steam on it suggesting a healthy cooking method for these foods being eaten. I want to touch very quickly on supplements. So there are a number of dietary supplements that claim to be a miracle for improving memory or concentration or giving you energy so you can focus. Um, these products come in all sorts of blends and magical things. Um, but the problem with them is that they are largely untested and unproven. So many supplements have no sound evidence that they actually work. Um, a lot of times people are advertising these magic pills and not doing any research on them at all. And then most supplements that have been studied have been shown not to be effective for treating or preventing memory loss. So if you are interested in a particular supplement, I would highly suggest communicating with your healthcare team that you are either taking a supplement or that you are interested in taking a supplement. Some dietary supplements can interact with medications or negate that medicine's effect. So it's really important that you talk to your doctor about these things. Also be aware that natural, the term natural, doesn't always mean safe. It's a marketing term and that producers of these supplements largely operate on the honor system. So the FDA does not test these products before they hit the market. Um, it's the manufacturer's responsibility to kind of keep in mind that these products should be safe. They are not tested before they hit the market. So the best way to get your nutrients is through food. Your body actually prefers nutrients in their food form, so those nutrients have a better bioavailability from food. Eating a nutrient-rich diet and using a reputable multivitamin daily to cover all your bases is the best and safest option. So if you do choose to take a multivitamin, make sure that it's from a trusted company. Don't just buy a homemade multivitamin or something like that. And then in some situations, you may have a medical condition where a supplement may help you, but make sure that you talk to your medical team about that. This green one with all of those. That's where I pulled this information from. They have quite the extensive website. It's very well done. They have all sorts of information and tips on maintaining that mental flexibility or becoming social if you're not quite as social as you'd like to be. They have resources on recipes and talking to your doctor, all sorts of things. And then another really great resource that I like is the Alzheimer's Association. They have really great resources on learning more about all aspects of memory and memory loss. Um, they have tips on how to talk to your doctor if you are a caregiver for someone and you need to talk to their doctor. Um, they have information on finding a support group. They have all sorts of great things, so I highly recommend both of these resources.